Okay, so it's now five past three, so we'll start this uh, um, uh, session. So basically, this is a, a clinical lecture demonstration. Uh, we are going to have the involvement of three departments, uh, myself from the Department of Clinical Medicine, uh, Dr. Nisha Rakud from the Department of Microbiology, and Dr. De Dr. Dinesh Jasing from the Department of Pathology. And we are going to uh, discuss two cases, uh, one after the other. And also, I think we should make it very interactive. So basically, what we will do is uh, we will uh, present some details and then give you some time to think and answer some questions. And you can type in your answers into the chat box. And then uh, we will take those answers and build on that as the case goes along. Okay, so let's start with the first case. So a 56-year-old man from Port Tower uh, presented to the hospital with a two-day history of fever. The onset of the fever has been acute, accompanied by chills, rigors, and headache, and joint and muscle pains, as well as vomiting. Uh, on examination, he had a temperature of 38, uh, blood pressure of uh, 105 by 70, a uh, heart rate of 80, uh, respiratory rate of 20, and a GCS of 14. This is stands for Glasgow Coma Scale, which is basically a measure that we do uh, by the bedside to see the level of consciousness. Uh, but in addition, that he had a conjunctival injection, which means that basically he had very red eyes because of uh, dilatation of the conjunctival vessels. Uh, so we use the word conjunctival injection when the vessels are dilated and they are very prominent, uh, but the background color of the sleeve is still quite white. Um, and he also had cervical lymphadenopathy on both sides of the neck. The throat was normal and the chest was clear and there was no meningism or photophobia and no no focal neurological signs as well. So he was admitted to hospital for further management. So basically he had an acute onset fever of two days duration uh, with uh, chills and dry cause and headache, joint pain, muscle pains, vomiting. Um, and he was conscious uh, with a conjunctival injection and cervical lymphadenopathy. So the first three thing that we'd like to ask you is uh, list three infectious diseases that can be the cause of this presentation. You would have seen patients coming with acute fevers to our wards and uh, you would have seen several causes of acute fever. So this, is, this also looks like very much like a very non-specific presentation. The only specific features which are important in this situation is that he has conjunctival injection, which is a little unusual for acute fevers, and lymph nodes in the neck. So what do you think can be the differential diagnosis for a patient with acute fever two days and cervical lymphadenopathy? So uh, take a minute to think about it and just type a few causes that you can think of in the chat box. So can someone type in a few possible causes? Okay, so there is leptospirosis, there is dengue.
Leptospirosis is a very good thought because that also presents as an acute fear with arthralgia and myelias. And conjunctive injection is also featured in that. So that's a very good thought. Uh, cervical lymphadenopathy is a little unusual, but uh, that can happen. You can get lymphoid enlargement as well. But anyway, certainly leptospirosis is a possibility. Dengue is another good thought because, uh, again, you get uh, uh, an acute onset fever with uh, conjunctive injection in the early stages. And you also can get uh, lymphadenopathy, uh, although, again, it's not common, but you do get it in, as in any other viral infection. And, of course, you also get arthralgia and myalgia and dengue, especially arthralgia, but you can get that as well. Then uh, typhus is, again, yes, that's a very good thought uh, because, again, uh, you get the red dyes or conjunctival injection uh, in typhus along with the acute fever. And also, specifically, uh, the, the lymph node enlargement is probably a little bit commoner in typhus than in the other two conditions, dengue and leptospirosis, although dengue and leptospirosis can both definitely cause lymph nodes also. Any other cause? Now, these are, these are the things that would come to our mind uh, uh, fairly early. That's, that is, these are the things that we also consider in our differential diagnosis fairly early, but can you think of other causes of acute febrile illness with uh, lymphadenopathy, generalized lymphadenopathy or cervical lymphadenopathy? Chikungunya, okay. Chikungunya, of course, occurs um, in... Um, uh, it, it, it's not common in sense. It has, it did, it did have a very big uh, outbreak in 2006 in Sri Lanka, actually in, in many parts of the world. Uh, but it hasn't been diagnosed since that time very frequently. So uh, it's, it seems to happen kind of like in, in waves. That is probably because uh, there is a lifelong immunity to the chikungunya infection once you get it in one particular community. Unlike dengue, as you know, dengue has four serotypes, so you can get it four times. Uh, because the immunity to one serotype is not specific for the other serotypes, uh, except in the uh, immediate recovery phase from one that particular phase, a serotype. But chikungunya, on the other hand, is uh, there's only one serotype, so once you get it, you are generally immune for life. And um, before our 2006 epidemic, the previous chikungunya epidemic in Sri Lanka was actually in the 1960s. So probably it took that long for us to develop a sizable number of. Uh, vulnerable or non-immune people to get another epidemic. Um, some, someone are, is asking, typhoid fever presents with lymphadenopathy, is that right? Well, actually, uh, typhoid can present as an acute febrile illness um, as well, um, and uh, uh, it has uh, vomiting and so on. It wouldn't produce conjunctival injections, and lymphadenopathy is not found in typhoid. Lymphadenopathy would be basically one thing that uh, more or less excludes typhoid and malaria. Those are two conditions, typhoid and malaria, where you would not expect a lymphadenopathy. So if you find lymph node enlargement in an acute febrile illness, you would um, make sure that, uh, you know, like you would like go for differential diagnosis without these two in that list. Any other thoughts or questions? Can you think of any other differential diagnosis? Viruses, what can you think of among viruses? We have been specifically focusing on bacteria, not specifically, I mean, there was dengue in the list, but uh, rubella, okay, right? That does cause red eyes and lymph nodes, that's good. Okay, any other possibility, any other viruses? If rubella is a differential diagnosis in a patient, then there's one other virus which is almost always in the differential diagnosis along with that. What is that virus? Something that goes hand in hand with rubella, very close to rubella. What is that virus? Measles, that's right, yeah. So somebody has typed in measles. Okay, so measles is possible, rubella is possible. They both cause conjunctival injection. Actually, uh, especially measles is very well known for these red dyes. They are very red. It, it might be a little bit more than just injection. You might find that even the background sclera is no longer white. It's very pinkish. That sometimes we give the we give the terms conjunctival suffusion for that. And you can even have a very uh, angry looking pair of eyes and even a discharge like a theory uh, watery discharge. 
subjective of conjunctivitis. So one of the first features of measles in the, in the very early stages, the first one or two days is, to, is having red teary eyes, uh, so resembling conjunctivitis, along with uh, very prominent upper respiratory symptoms like uh, poor eyes, uh, runny nose, sneezing, sore throat, and so on. So that is found in measles and also in rubella. But uh, even though in, in this particular patient, we are not talking about upper respiratory fe features, certainly the red eyes and the lymph nodes are part of measles and rubella also. Okay, can you think of another virus apart from rubella and measles? Something which causes lymph node enlargement? A virus, virus uh, causing lymph gland enlargement. Sometimes we use the name glandular fever for this. What is that virus? What causes glandular fever? Which virus? Or which group of viruses? Well, there's a virus called Epstein Barr virus, which is one of the herpes simplex virus group viruses. Yeah, so that can cause glandular fever. So, okay, that's a fairly good differential diagnosis. Uh, we have uh, with a lot of leptospirosis, typhus, dengue, rubella, measles, um, and chikungunya also. Chikungunya, I would not uh, make it as very likely, but um, the other ones, of course, are part of the differential diagnosis. What further questions can you ask in the history to find out the possible cause of this patient. Now we have a differential diagnosis. We are talking about dengue, leptospirosis, um, rubella and measles, uh, typhus, um, and maybe Epstein-Barr virus causing glandular fever. So we have a fairly good differential diagnosis for this. So at this stage, uh, can you think of any questions you would like to ask for each of these conditions, which might give a clue, something relating to, for example, exposure. So uh, think of a question to ask and then and also write which condition you are, you are thinking about. In, in asking that question, write the question you are going to ask and for which condition in your answer. Okay, um, so uh, occupation for leptospirosis. So probably you are going to ask about occupations like being a farmer and so on. Um, so you need to tell us what occupations you had in mind also. And somebody else says lepto contamination with stagnant water, so exposure to stagnant water. So I explained to that, explained that to you in that leptospirosis lecture to some, to some extent. Okay, so you can ask about occupational and environmental exposures to stagnant waters. Uh, in the case of leptospirosis, so oh, that's fine. Okay, any other questions you want to ask for any other condition in that differential diagnosis? Yes, MMR vaccine status. Okay, what is? Association with children and daycare centers for measles and rubella. That is very good. Okay, and and, and also Epstein Barr virus infection. That's a good, that's a good question to ask. Okay. Any other questions? Do we have a rash typically behind the neck or behind the ears for measles? Yeah, well, I mean, rash, clearly you must ask that. But the rash is actually uh, something which starts in the face and then comes down the trunk. Uh, behind the ears and, and behind the ears and the neck, I think you are, you are probably um, focusing, I think you, what you get behind the ears and behind the neck are the lymph nodes in measles. But certainly you must ask about a rash, especially in the, in the face. 
but uh, the, the same person can I ask another question from you I mean is there if there was no rash or if the patient with measles is presented to you uh, before the rash in the third room or phase uh, what would you check to see whether it is measles is there a sign that you would like to check for measles if someone has given the answer already uh, got big spots in the mouth okay that's good and for uh, dengue you are going to ask about mosquito bites somebody has typed in right for typhus condition no hygiene of domestic pets of the house mm. okay any other questions and for the other conditions is there any other question you could ask for typhus uh, you 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 said somebody has said eshka and look for them that is fine uh, but um, yeah that's fine but any other question you could ask for typhus bite of mites yes you might know have noticed a, a bite of a tick okay or a mite and also you can ask about uh, travel history you can ask about whether you went into areas which are famous for shrub jungle shrub tribes such as uh, wilpattu and yale and also certain areas like the northwestern province i mentioned the, the areas the other day uh, like halaut puttalam uh, puliyapitiya that area in the northwestern province as well as uh, kampola navalapitiya maavanel kagal in the central province and then the northern province is it's quite common in the, in the northern province in jaffna peninsula and in the southern province also you, uh, you can find it in gol mathura hambantara districts so travel to those areas or living in those areas would also be an important question to ask so we have covered questions for leptospirosis for typhus uh, for dengue also residents in a certain area the dengue dengue prevalent area measles and rubella we have covered okay good so we now know some questions to ask them as well okay on the third day of the illness he develops a generalized maculopapular rash so you can see the rash photography on the left hand side very nice maculopapular rash all over the body and then there's also a lesion noted on the leg so list three possible infectious disease causes i think we'll focus on the rash first to find the three possible causes and then we think about the lesion in the leg later so basically can you tell us um, Uh, in a patient with acute fever now on the third day of fever with uh, lymph nodes in the neck and red eyes and a maculopapular rash what would be your differential diagnosis now we are, we are as you can see we can now narrow down now our long possibilities into a short list of possibilities uh, measles rubella typhus so that looks like my three list also that that's very good okay So let's go to the next question then. The doctor then detects a two centimeter splenomegaly. List three possible causes. Do you want to go ahead and list three possible causes? Out of our original uh, initial differential diagnosis. again we will ignore the the leg lesion for the time being we will just focus on the fever day 3 and the rash and the lymph nodes and the red dyes typhus okay because typhus does cause enlargement of the spleen and the liver mm -hmm. any other cause rubella okay even measles and i think we can still think of uh, extreme bowel virus infection or glandular fever when the spleen is the spleen is in large must always think about glandular fever right okay so these are the uh, investigations we have got on day 3 he has hemoglobin of 11 which is a bit low a normal white cell count but the lymphocyte count is very low and platelets are also low but no fragments on the film He has a very high CRP, 160. Uh, the the urea and the lymphocyte are normal. 
Bilirubin is normal. ALCST is elevated. Gamma G3 is normal. You have seen the blood culture. We haven't got a call from the lab saying it is positive. Normally, when the blood culture is positive, the laboratory calls into the ward to say that it is positive. It may become positive in the laboratory at uh, any time after inoculation. So, for example, uh, if you send the blood culture to the laboratory, they will immediately put it into the, uh, to the uh, automated culture machine. And the culture sometimes becomes positive at uh, 8 hours or 12 hours or 24 hours or whatever number of hours. But as soon as it becomes positive, the, the automated culture machine gives an alarm and the immunity will go and check that particular bottle and inform the, the, the ward uh, to say that the blood culture is positive because the positive blood culture is a very important, very significant finding. And the, uh, the doctors in the ward are immediately required to look into the patient's condition to see whether the patient is all right. And if the patient is not only in antibiotics, to start some empirical antibiotic therapy intravenously because a bacteria may have a very significant thing. It can be uh, life-threatening. Um, so because of that, the, the laboratory does not wait till next morning to print the report. They call the ward then and there and tell. So when you are a house officer, you will get these calls um, as soon as the culture is positive. Uh, so let's say, for example, we send the culture from the ward to the lab at 4 p.m., uh, then at about 9 or 10 p.m., everybody has gone home or to the quarters, and it's about six hours after uh, taking the culture. At 12 midnight, the culture might become positive, and the laboratory will, the on call, MLT will immediately call the ward at 12 midnight. So you may be the only doctor in the ward at that time, the house officer. And uh, you have to understand why he is calling. Uh, some, <laughs> you should not be scolding the MLT for calling at night. You should immediately thank the person. And sometimes you can ask whether you have an indication what that organism is. Normally, at that point, they don't know for sure. They have to just uh, inoculate that into other culture media. Uh, so you have to go back to the patient and check whether the patient is all right and think of what the blood culture positivity may be due to. Can it be a gram positive focus or a gram negative bacillus, depending on the clinical, you know, the clinically suspected condition? And then you have to immediately start an antibiotic intravenously if the patient is not on antibiotics at that time. So. Uh, here we have sent the blood culture, but so far no call. Uh, so maybe, maybe we can assume that it is so far negative. And the patient was anyway commenced on on just to cover the possibility of uh, having a bacteremic illness or serious bacterial infection, which I think is a very good thought because he has a CRP of 160. So when a CRP is 160, then it's a good idea to keep an antibiotic uh, uh, for the patient uh, without waiting for any further evidence of... Uh, bacterial infection. So that is why these investigations are very important. We have to send a full blood count, we have to send a CRP, um, and sometimes full blood count might show neutrophil leukocytosis or something like that, which will again indicate there's a pyogenic infection going on. Uh, of the C if the CRP is high, then we know that there's something rather serious going on, um, and so on. So this is the situation now at the moment. Now we are still in day three or you know maybe at night on day three. Right, so uh, now, we, at this point, we are going to hand over to uh, Dr. Dr. Nisha Rakhud from the Microbiology Department, uh, who will uh, address these questions. Nisha, do you want to take over? Nisha, are you there? We can't hear you. you uh, I don't know whether you have muted your mic. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay, Go ahead. great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Pandukar. Okay, so we have uh, done some baseline uh, blood tests, and we've discussed the implications of them. This is a, a mildly anemic patient with a moderate transaminitis and a high CRP. So those were the things that sort of stood out from the uh, the, the uh, investigations, the baseline investigations. And of note, as Dr. Pandukar said, blood culture to date is negative. So considering the other differentials that uh, we were discussing, can uh, people just say, how would we test for, uh, if we were considering a diagnosis of rubella or measles, how would we test if we were considering a diagnosis of Epstein-Barr virus, can you all please uh, indicate in the chat? 
how would we test if we are thinking about typhus or leptospirosis just briefly just a uh, message okay so we've got here a uh, serological test for rubella which is correct and i've got here pcr but nobody has uh, uh, please please indicate what the pcr is for which test which which uh, pathogen so uh, we've got here dark brown microscopy for leptospirosis which is technically correct but it's not a very sensitive method so we've also got here mat test for leptospirosis which is correct okay so i think uh, those are some uh, specific tests that we can do for pathogens and uh, how about for dengue guys what what do we do here routinely and also considering that this is a patient with acute fever with rash lymphadenopathy and in this case splenomegaly we should be thinking about epstein barr virus yes ns1 antigen for dengue very good okay before we move on to the next slide consider the pentasporin ceftriaxone for uh, as as the first treatment w would anyone like to add anything else in terms of treatment for any of the differential diagnoses that we are considering in this particular patient so we have got that someone would like to add doxycycline so again if we are considering um doxycycline uh, well it would cover definitely uh typhus but also it would have some effect against leptospirosis as well which is what they have suggested it for okay so i think since only doxycycline has been uh, suggested it um i think you guys are thinking that for many of the others it is supportive treatment particularly for the viral uh, etiology dr pandukar could we have the next slide please okay so in this patient guys don't forget hiv because hiv can actually definitely present with a rash fever sore throat lymphadenopathy and then you know we nobody considered taking a a uh, sexual history for this patient if they have had risk factors definitely syphilis serology should also be sent and we've also already mentioned epstein barr virus epstein barr virus serology was sent and was negative next please dr pandukar so depending on whether this patient has been traveling etc you must consider malaria in your differential diagnosis for an acute undifferentiated febrile illness and the malaria film and rapid diagnostic test was negative uh, next uh, dr pandukar the dengue art uh, rapid diagnostic test which is a combination of the ns1 antigen and antibodies was also negative next please okay so scrub typhus rapid diagnostic test came back as positive now this is not something that is routinely available but it was done for this patient as part of a research study and then since it was positive and the capacity was there to do some further tests this patient had a um, a blood test sent and essentially the white blood section from the blood whole blood was removed it was separated and that is known as the buffy coat and that was sent to do a pcr test for rickettsia and orientia species and also serum was taken from this patient at this acute stage and then uh, at around 3 to 4 weeks again a convalescent serology was sent for uh, an ifa and also 
for an ELISA test. So IFA is, um, is standing for the indirect fluorescent assay and ELISA is standing for enzyme uh, linked immunosorbent assay. Okay, so uh, next, next please. Next, please. So, the final diagnosis in this patient was indeed scrub typhus. So, as a reminder, scrub typhus is caused by Orientia sutsubumashi and is spread by the trigger of the larval trombiculate mite. And this diagnosis was confirmed by PCR and also by a fourfold rise in the titers of IgM, IgG, comparing the acute and convalescent serum samples tested by both the indirect fluorescent antibody test and on ELISA. So that um, Dr. Panduka, um, actually, I, I thought I had a, a, a picture of the indirect fluorescent um, antibody assay, but it doesn't matter. Essentially, what, what is done, how it works, is that the, you, you have... Uh, Manisha, if you want, if I can unshare for you to share from your computer if you like. No, no, it's fine, Dr. Panduka, it doesn't matter at all. So, how it works is that the patient serum is spread over a smear of rickettsial anti antigens, and if anti-rickettsial antibodies are present in the serum, these will bind. Then the serum is washed off and a secondary antibody is added. And this secondary antibody is an anti-human immunoglobulin, which is conjugate, uh, conjugated to a fluorogen. And that's what you see when you look under the fluorescent microscope. So it's important, guys, that if you're doing these uh, specialist tests, which are available at the MRI, for example, that it must be, the blood sample must be sent as early as possible. So definitely within seven days. And it must be taken before you start doxycycline because that is going to hugely decrease your yield of getting a positive result. So in this particular uh, patient, we had the luxury of doing the indirect fluorescent antibodies for the other rickettsial species. And just to remind you here, it was negative for epidemic typhus group, which as we know is Laos, bon uh, Laos born by a lice. And the causative agent is rickettsia proboscidei. It was negative for murine typhus group, which is flea born rickettsia typhi. It was negative for spotted fever group, which is a tick born and such an example would be rickettsia connery. And it was also negative for coxiella burnetti, which is the causative agent of Q fever. And it is spread by contact, close contact with the feces or urine or milk or birth products, which get, uh, can contaminate dust surrounding infected cattle. Okay, shall we have the next slide, Dr. Pandaka? Okay, and just to note here that if we were going to be doing indirect fluorescent antibody uh, tests. It is a test that will require actually being having a good supply of these uh, Orientia antigens. And so for that reason, you would have to grow Orientia sutsugumashi. And it's an intracellular pathogen requiring specialized cell culture. And this is not readily available because you need special biological safety level three facilities. So this is for your educational purposes. And this is to explain why it is difficult to diagnose rickettsial infections. We are mainly dependent on an excellent clinical history and examination. But this is to illustrate the specialist tests that are possible to do to confirm a diagnosis. Next slide, please. Okay, so as Dr. Panduka has already um, mentioned, this is just a figure from that was from a paper by Dr. Veranya Leonapathiranov in Peridinia, 
which illustrates that scrub typhus is found around the country. So I just draw your attention to the orange um, stars. And um, the seroprevalence study did not unfortunately receive samples from the northern and the western province, which definitely does have scrub typhus. But for the scrub typhus seropositive group, the main occupation was farming, which included rice cultivation, forestry, oil palm and rubber plantations, mostly in the intermediate dry zone. And then if I just draw your attention to the yellow stars, that is representing the rickettsial spotted fever group. And these were from samples received from base hospital Navalapitiya, Gampola, which drain patients from the surrounding estates. So spotted fever rickettsiosis was the predominant rickettsiosis found in patients uh, presenting to the base hospitals, Gampola, Navalapitiya, Marvanella, Mathale, Diathalava, General Hospitals, Kegal and Badulla Teaching Hospitals, Kandy and Peradenia, and also, as you can see, in the Southern Belt, in Hamban Toto, and also in Monaragala. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a paper that was done by uh, Professor Ranjan Premaratna and the Kelania group. And it is just to remind you guys that both Rickettsia species and Orentia species are important causes of CNS infections, which can be cranial nerve um, abnormalities. And you know this is actually talking about cranial nerve eight, which is patients presenting with deafness. And it can cause encephalitis and um, it is a multi-organ presentation. It is not common, but you should keep it in your differential diagnosis for these acutely undifferentiated febrile illnesses that present with other manifestations. And you can see in this manifest uh, in this table, this um, you can also see that patients uh, had SCARS, pneumonitis, and myocarditis. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think actually um, that comes to the end of uh, case history one. Are there any questions for Dr. Panduko or myself? So if you have any questions on typhus or this differential diagnosis before we move on, uh, please type in and ask the question now. So, um, as I said in my lecture, uh, the MRI does offer the PCR for typhus, but I, I think I explained that it's a little bit difficult to do because you have to get a very fresh sample across the MRI. So, um, unfortunately for uh, patients who are not hidden around Colombo, that's not much of an option unless if the patient is well enough to come to the MRI and then do the blood sample. Um, but apart from that, we uh, at the moment, we don't have... Uh, Test for typhus apart from uh, during research studies and so on. So, do you have any uh, questions or shall we move on to the next case? Okay, fine. So, we'll move on to the next case. So, this is a new one a 56 year old man from again from Port Tower presented to the hospital OPD with fever of six days duration. So, he has been at home for a little longer duration than the previous case. So you remember that the, the typhus case came on the third day, or the, the second day rather, and got the rash on the third day. Uh, so this patient has been staying at home for five more days. And that's important because that basically means that uh, it's not as an, as, uh, an acute an illness uh, as the, the previous patient. Uh, the onset of the fever has been gradual, accompanied by headache, nausea, and some abdominal pain. Um, so basically, it's, it's a more gradual, gradually progressive febrile illness rather than a very acute onset febrile illness. And the examination was unremarkable. We did not have the, the red dyes and the lymph nodes that we had in the previous patient. Uh, so he was admitted to hospital and you can see a, a temperature chart. 
And what is interesting about this temperature chart is that uh, it, it's not a very spiky temperature. A spiky temperature is, would be if you know you have a you have spikes like like the action potential spikes that you see in, in the nerve. Uh, but this one is a, a bit more uh, a gradual rise, and the, the temperature variation is very small. Unlike in a spiky temperature, where you have a very tall spike and a rise of temperature by several degrees centigrade. So this is sometimes also called a step ladder fashion, a step ladder fever, where the, it appears as though the fever is climbing the steps and going up, rather than going up as a spike. So at least two infectious diseases that can cause this presentation. So do you want to type it in and tell what might be the cause in a, a patient who is uh, 56 years old, a male, six days fever, gradual onset, gradually progressing, a step ladder fashion, and normal examination. So two people have typed in typhoid fever. Another person has typed, typed in enteric fever. That's good. That is all the, the same thing. Uh, in, of course, the enteric fever is a more general term for typhoid and paratyphoid. So typhoid is a more specific uh, uh, infection in the enteric fever umbrella. Can you think of any other cause? Well, at this stage of six years fever, it's very difficult to say what might be the cause, but anything that even ends up as a PUO, such as an endocarditis and so on, might present like this. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. What further questions can you ask in the history to find out the possible cause in this patient? So if you, sus if you are suspecting typhoid, then what are the questions that you want to ask? Uh, for example, to find out whether the patient has had any risk of acquiring typhoid. Uh, whether he has eaten from outside, food habits. That's right. So basically, we have to focus on that patient's food hygiene. Um, so if you are very careful about your food hygiene and eat uh, well-cooked food uh, and drink only uh, safe water from your own home or wherever you go, then you are generally safe from infections which are fecal or transmitted. But on the other hand, if you uh, eat from every place without, without being very discriminating against where you are eating from and Therefore, put yourself at risk of uh, eating uh, badly cooked food or food which is contaminated with, uh, uh, so, uh, with uh, unsafe water and so on. You might pick up fecal oral transmitted pathogens. So as you know, typhoid is due to a fecal oral transmitted pathogen. So that's an important question to ask if you are suspecting a typhoid in a patient. The patient is a businessman who travels extensively for his work. During his travel, he is compelled to take food from wherever it is available. He has poor food hygiene. So basically, you can see that uh, the reason why these people eat food like that is not because of their fault, <coughs> sorry, but because of the nature of their work and the nature of their lifestyle and so on. They are compelled to uh, consume food from wherever that they can get it. Uh, like for example, this is very, very common for travelers or businessmen who travel extensively uh, to not be able to get the food that they want from the sort of place they like and they are exposed to uh, poor food hygiene. So which pathogen that is transmitted by the fecal oral route can produce this illness? Typhoid. Uh, Nisha, over to you. Okay, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So can we have the, uh, can you click uh, Dr. Pandukar? Okay, so guys, this patient has a mildly low total white blood count, a mild transaminitis, and again, we see that he has a raised CRP. Next, please. Nisha, we can't hear you. Hello.
มีชาอยู่เนี้ยมีกันเทียอยู่อ่า sorry อ่านิชาเฮส losty wifi connection so she is trying to log in through a uh, hotspot so we'll give her a minute or two So while she is um, trying to get herself connected once again, um, so the important points in the investigation that we have seen so far is mm. the fact that there is a. If you look at these, you can see that the, there is a leukopenia. Uh, thrombocytopenia can also happen, but it's a bit uncommon in in typhoid. Uh, again, the transaminases. This goes to show that the uh, transaminases is a very non-specific feature of many infectious diseases. So we don't. Uh, uh, we can't use it very frequently as a specific uh, condition, but at the same time, of, of course, there are some conditions like leptospirosis where we have to think about liver involvement. Um, and uh, CRP is very important and, uh, and a very valuable investigation in the clinical setting What because. Up, Panduka. Yeah. I'm back. Ah, okay, that's great. Yeah, please take over. Okay. Um, Dr. Panduka, where up to where did you all hear me? Did you all hear about the cultures? Uh, we heard about the CRP. Okay, so guys, the next step is to do a culture. The gold standard would be to do a culture from blood or from bone marrow. Please note that the bacterial concentration in bone marrow is ten times the bacterial concentration in peripheral blood. So, if you're going to do a blood culture, guys. It's important to try and do it within the first seven days of illness because that's when your yield is highest. And do consider uh, doing multiple blood cultures. And for each blood culture, you want to get a minimum volume of 10 mils. So important uh, concepts: do your blood cultures early, so ideally within the first week. Have appropriate volumes, and consider doing multiple blood cultures. Okay, uh, Dr. Panduka, next. So, in this patient, uh, you can see here in the diagram in the figure that is McConkie's agar, and you can see colonies with a characteristic black dot in the center of the colony, which is actually hydrogen sulfide. So, that is typical of Salmonella colonies, and this, as you can see, the uh, McConkie agar has not been depigmentated, so these are non-lactose fermenters. If you were to take a sample and do a gram stain, what you would see would be characteristic gram-negative rods. Okay, so uh, am, am I still there, Dr. Panduka? Yes, you are you're still on. So preliminary identification is based on colony appearance on chromogenic or other selective agar medium. Then we can go on to do serological confirmation tests, which typically use different combinations of antisera against the Salmonella lipopolysaccharide uh, O, the capsular polysaccharide VI, and the 
um, flagella H antigens, which are added to a positive culture isolate, and then you assess for a gluten. <laughs> Next, please. And it's also uh, important to note that after the first week, you can also do cultures from stool and even from urine. But the sensitivity of stool culture is poor in comparison with blood, approximately 40%. Uh, sorry, Dr. Pandukar, just go back one, please. And it's also, uh, please note that you, you can also do PCR-based assays for an, uh, identification of salmonella species uh, using st stool specimens. Okay, let's go on. N Nisha, do you want to tell them what a multiplex uh, assay is? Uh, that's a new term for us. Yes. So the multiplex is essentially you are uh, doing a PCR reaction, which is the amplification of DNA or RNA, um, and you are targeting different genes. So the multiplex might be uh, assessing for something that is specific to uh, Salmonella typhi or sal Salmonella enterophy, uh, enterica uh, typhi, um, and at the same time looking to differentiate it from other species, such as uh, the non-salmonella typhi. So you are, uh, a multiplex looks at multiple genes at the same time in the same assay. Okay, so this I will just briefly mention as well. This slide is to remind you about the serotyping of salmonella. Salmonella enterica is divided into typhoidal salmonella and non-typhoidal salmonella. Typhoidal salmonella only affects humans and includes salmonella typhi as well as paratyphi A and B, which are clinically indistinguishable from typhoid fever. And just to mention that in 2017, there were around 500 cases of uh, typhi, paratyphi notified to the EPID unit, and these were highest in the Baunia district. Also, Manna, Jaffna, and Putlam also considered the higher risk districts. Okay, let's move on. So, I think now let's move on to our uh, pathologist, Dr. Dinesha Jaisinger, who's going to take, take us through some of the pathogenesis. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, so in this patient, uh, you saw different uh, clinical symptoms and investigation results. The patient came with uh, sort of a stepwise increase in temperature, had mild abdominal pain, and had a leukopenia with mildly elevated uh, transaminases and increased CRP. So basically, those were the symptoms and the investigation results that you saw. So what is the process by which the those symptoms and the, the investigation results occurred in this patient. Can we move on, sir? Okay, so uh, you may have gone through the pathogenesis in your clinic, le previous lecture previously. So you know that salmonelli can, uh, they enter the GI tract through the fecal oral route. And these organisms are able to withstand the gastric acid and then they enter the intestines and through the intestines, they enter the mesenteric lymph nodes. Uh, and from the mesenteric uh, lymph nodes, they drain through the lymphatics into the thoracic duct and from there into blood, which will cause a primary bacteremia. Next, please, sir. So this process causes a primary bacteremia. And with this bacteremia, they go on to multiple sites like the liver, the gallbladder, spleen, kidney, and bone marrow, and they multiply in these different sites. So this period, the patient will not have any symptoms. The patient will not will basically be asymptomatic. But once the, the organism multiplies in multiple organ, organs, 
then this leads to a secondary bacteremia. So if you can click, which is heavier than the previous bacteremia. And it is at this point that the patient will start showing clinical symptoms. Um, so if you can, yes. So this will be the onset of clinical symptoms. What you saw in this patient, the fever and uh, the mild abdominal pain will start from this point onwards. Because when the organisms multiply in the liver and in the gallbladder, they get, again re-enter the intestines. Uh, click, please, sir. Yes. So they re-enter the intestines through the bile during the second week of uh, the process and uh, the illness. And then when they enter the intestines, they tend to localize in the pears patches, the malt, the mucosa-associated lymphoid system. And they multiply within these lymphoid follicles. Next, please. And this causes an inflammation of these pears patches with ulceration of the overlying mucosa. And this is a form of a delayed type hypersensitivity and also the endotoxins of the organisms also play a role. And at this point, they will start shedding organisms in stools. So next please. So the organisms at this point can be detected in a stool culture at, as well. So initial, the, uh, pr during the primary bacteremia, the patient will be asymptomatic. So no one will know that the patient has the illness, but the secondary heavier bacteremia will cause clinical symptoms. And at that point, which is the febrile phase of the illness, you can isolate organisms in blood. Whereas later when there is inflammation and ulceration of the intestines, then you may be be able to culture organisms in stools. Next slide, please. So about seven to 10 days after the onset of clinical symptoms, antibodies against the organism will appear and the organism therefore will disappear from blood. So that is why Dr. Nisha said that it is very important to do the blood culture during the first week of illness, because that is the point where you will be able to isolate the organism in blood. Next, please. Okay, so what happens in the intestine uh, when the organism re-enters through bile and infects the intestine? So the organism gets into the pears patches and the pears patches undergo an inflammatory swelling. You might remember that this patient had a leukopenia with low neutrophils. That is because these are facultative intracellular bacteria. So they respond uh, the response mounted against these uh, organisms are, are mainly mononuclear infiltrates. So the infiltrate will be macrophages, lymphocytes, and plasma cells, as opposed to the extracellular bacteria, where you see neutrophil infiltration. In typhoid, neutrophils are usually absent or at most minimal. And there can be inflammatory or immune-mediated necrosis. So when the pears patches undergo swelling, there will be associated necrosis of the mucosa, which can cause ulceration of the intestine. And the macrophages associated with this inflammatory response will um, engulf the cell debris and the red cells. And the inflammation may not remain within the pears patches only. They can extend upwards toward the mucosa and also through the, the muscle layer. Next, please. So macroscopically, if you do uh, an endoscopy, what you will see would be, be swollen pears patches, areas of swelling associated with necrosis, causing ulceration of the mucosa. Next, please. Okay, so these ulcers called typhoid ulcers they are said to be characteristically longitudinal. That is, uh, uh, they are um, formed parallel to the long axis of the intestine and also elongated and ovoid. And they are said to be smooth ulcers. So, so 
they don't usually cause strictures. So this is opposed to um, in TB, where TB can also cause intestinal ulcers, but they are usually um, circumferential ulcers, transfers to the long axis of the intestine, and they are not smooth ulcers. They can cause strictures. So typhoid ulcers usually don't cause strictures and they are elongated and along the axis of the intestine. So if you see a macroscopic specimen or if you ever do a postmortem on one of these patients, this is what you will see. Uh, and although in this patient, what it led to was a mild abdominal pain, probably because of the mesenteric uh, lymphadenitis and maybe a few ulcers, other complications can occur like because these ulcers, the inflammatory response can uh, go through the muscle layer, the intestine can undergo perforation and there can be hemorrhage and resultant peritonitis and a fatal bacteremia. Next please sir. So other complications um, can also occur. Now in enteric fever, not only the intestine can be involved because there is a bacteremia and it can enter a lot of organs, the, and the uh, organism anyhow multiplies in different organs. So there can be hemorrhagic lymphadenitis in the mesenteric lymph nodes. You know that the organism uh, multiplies in the liver. So if it's very severe, there can be parenchymal necrosis of the liver, which will cause uh, much higher rises of the trans transaminases Then they can uh, multiply in the gallbladder and infect the gallbladder leading to polycystitis. They can multiply in the spleen, uh, giving rise to a hyperplasia of follicles. They can infect the kidneys, muscles, joints, uh, bone, bone as well, and um, osteitis, osteomyelitis, especially uh, they say in patients with sickle cell disease, they are more prone to uh, get salmonella osteomyelitis, can also cause infection of the CNS. And there, there can also be toxin-mediated uh, ileus, renal tibular necrosis, and even arrhythmia. So it's not limited to the intestine. There can be um, infection and complications in other organs of the body as well. Next slide, please. I think uh, Dr. Nisha will take over from here. Okay. So what do we treat this patient with? What we're seeing on the slide is an ABST from this patient's blood culture. So can we, uh, first of all, to make you aware that there is definitely resistance in this patient. And this patient is resistant to amoxicillin and ampicillin, resistant to cotrimoxazole, resistant to, and quite worryingly, uh, resistant to fluoroquinolones, including ciprofloxacin and analytic acid as well, resistant. So can you guys use the chat, please, to let me know uh, what you would consider treating this particular patient who does not have any of the complications which uh, Dr. Dinesha spoke about in the last slide, but definitely has resistant typhoid. What would you guys treat the patient with? And uh, for bonus marks, what duration of treatment would you give? Please use the chat to give some indication. Okay. So we've got keftriaxone here, yes. Uh, we've got quite a few keftriaxones. Uh, if you were treating the patient uh, with kef uh, uncomplicated drug-resistant typhoid, how, how long would you give the keftriaxone for? Any ideas? Okay, so it sounds like you're not quite sure the duration, but keftriaxone in an uncomplicated typhoid, you'd probably get, get away with five days of treatment. Uh, 
And if, uh, you can see here that chloramphenicol is also sensitive, and this is something that has been traditionally used to treat typhoid. Chloramphenicol can be given for 14 days. And we can see here that azithromycin is also sensitive and has the additional benefit of being an oral antibiotic. So you could get away with a seven-day course of azithromycin in uncomplicated typhoid. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, guys, so this is just a slide to remind you that the use of antibiotics without proper rationale has led to massive resistance in typhoid fever. There is what is known as extensively drug resistant salmonella typhi uh, that is circulating, particularly in South Asian countries where it is very easy to get antibiotics or it has been traditionally very easy to get antibiotics over the counter. So, you know, every uh, diarrheal in infection, people are taking antibiotics for, including very commonly taking ciprofloxacin for diarrheal infections. So a patient uh, uh, in which you are suspecting typhoid, you cannot empirically give antibiotics. You must wait for a culture, and only if your culture is negative and you're not really sure what you're treating, would you go for empirical antibiotics, or if the patient is very septic and unwell. But for other cases, wait for your culture result, wait for your ABST, and be led by that. Next, please. OK. Um, I could do this slide as well, I suppose. Um, um, guys, can can this infection, after the five days of keptriaxone or the uh, seven days of azithromycin, can it reoccur in this patient? Is it known to happen? Can you all just use the chat and answer? Okay, so nobody's answering, but uh, I don't know whether you've actually had your lecture. Ah, thank you. So definitely, uh, I've got here that 5%, but it's actually 5 to 15% of patients treated with the antibiotics can experience a relapse of typhoid fever after initial recovery. And relapses typically occur approximately one week after therapy has been discontinued, but can occur up to 70 days after uh, relapse can happen up to 70 days um, after the cessation of antibiotic treatment. So uh, next, please. OK, and then also there is what's known as the chronic carrier stage. And this is um, um, where, where patients are chronically shedding the bacteria in their stool. And we know in history there have been several uh, cases of this, and it's particularly an issue if these people are uh, in occupations where they're dealing with food. They may not know that they're ill. They are not having any symptoms, they're asymptomatic, but they're chronically shedding it. So essentially, um, our patient is a patient who has been diagnosed with typhoid and treated with typhoid. But uh, if you retest, they represent with symptoms, then you would go for a four to six week uh, regimen with an appropriate antibiotic. And certainly, as Dr. Dinesha said, uh, patients who have uh, gallstones or chronic cholecystitis, they have even higher risks of being uh, having recurrences and being chronic shedders. And then you may want to consider a cholecystectomy uh, to eliminate the uh, carrier state. And unfortunately, even after um, being treated with a longer, much longer course of an appropriate antibiotic for recurrences, patients can still relapse after four to six weeks uh, of the antimicrobial therapy. And these patients who are then, you know, chronic, they should receive long-term suppressive therapy. 
Dr. Dinesha and uh, Dr. Panduka, is there anything you'd like to add to that slide? Um, uh, no, Nisha, but uh, I mean, since you've been working in the UK, you might be able to tell them a bit about, you know, how, how you would um, uh, uh, manage the patient. I think you already did, but uh, there's a public health angle to that, to that as well. For example, um, one thing that I found uh, very interesting in the UK itself when I was working there is that uh, those work carriers are actually asked to stay at home uh, and not go to work as a food handler. Um, uh, until two cultures are negative. And in the meantime, the government uh, or the state pays them uh, their, you know, their income so that they can stay at home. The problem here, I think, is that uh, in Sri Lanka, even if we do diagnose a carrier state, uh, we will not be able to keep them at home and pay them uh, to stay at home away from food handling jobs. And uh, if that is their only way of um, making a living, then they will somehow find a way to work without being caught and be a food handler and keep spreading that. So I think um, um, uh, so you must have come across patients there who uh, uh, perhaps who, who have been told to stay at home without being a food handler until yes, they sir. were. Yeah, so I, yeah. I think sort of a pragmatic approach, a practical approach would be after the patient finishes their course of treatment, you wait two to four days and then you send off three fecal specimens for culture, which I guess is obviously, you know, uh, it may take a few more days to come back, but it's a, a cheap test. And it's, um, if all three are negative, then that's, um, that's at least a safe way to, uh, you know, allow the patient to go back to work. But obviously, as we said, guys, don't get confused. Uh, there is the, uh, you know, we're talking about a couple of things here. One is being a chronic carrier of, uh, typhoid and the other one is having a relapse so um, the re relapse might th that relapse patient might have had a, a, a negative stool culture at the end of their treatment but they can relapse even later so be aware of it and Dr. Panduka makes a very important public health uh, consideration that re relapses do occur recurrences do occur and there is a small proportion of chronic carriers and you should be uh, at least, you know, uh, educate your patient and take, you know, at least those uh, additional stool cultures at the end of treatment that you can do. Okay, that's great. I, I think we have come to the end of our slides, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's good. So that's fine. And we did, I think we did some two very interesting cases. Um, so uh, do you have any questions to ask any one of us? on either of the cases? In the meantime, Dinesha, do you want to add anything before we uh, wind up, Dinesha? No, sir. I think everything was covered. Okay. Okay. I, I've got a couple of questions here. Okay. Uh, uh, in typhoid, organisms are positive in stools before in the urine or the other way. So, guys, it, uh, I mean, traditionally, you know, uh, we say that from the second week, uh, or, you know, and definitely by the third week, you'll be able to uh, culture um, from stool. And uh, the urine, if you are able to culture, will be even after that. So we're going, we're talking about, about the fourth week. But, you know, certainly the more uh, specimens you send and uh, some uh, organ sites that you're trying to sample, the better. But... I mean, I certainly, in a sick patient for whom I haven't got the, to the bottom of their infection, rather than thinking about uh, uh, sending a urine culture, I might consider doing the bone marrow for culture. So do keep that in mind in terms of what your yield is going to be. Uh, and uh, I've also got an, a question saying, um, in relapse, uh, is the stool negative? Uh, no, the, the in relapse... Um, the, the stool is likely to be positive. 
Uh, but I mean, again, if the patient comes back with, uh, you know, a fever and unwell, uh, I would do blood cultures as my first line test. And I would also send off stool cultures, particularly if the patient is having evidence of bowel in inflammation and diarrhea. I, I hope that's helpful. And, and the Vidal test, uh, yes, guys, it, it's, it's there and we learn about it. Uh, but it's not a it's not a specific test. There's a lot of cross reactivity. If you've ever had a, a salmonella infection in the past, it can be positive. If you have a single uh, serum test se serum sample for the Vidal test, it's difficult to interpret it. You would definitely need to look for an increase in titers. Um, so it's not you can have cross reactions, and uh, you definitely have to have an acute and convalescent uh, serum. So. Because culture is gold standard uh, and uh, the Vidal test is so non-specific, uh, I didn't really cover it today. Uh, and then I've got bone, bone marrow culture B2 invasive compared to the others. You know, if this is a sick patient with complications of um, complicated disease and considering that we might have a drug resistant uh, typhoid, you know, XDR typhoid might need to have a carbapenem like meropenem. So, you know, having that invasive test might actually make the difference into whether this patient can be treated and recover versus someone who is partially treated, has multiple relapses, develops further complications. So it's all on a case by case basis where you look at the full picture. You wouldn't, uh, in a very uncomplicated uh, typhoid, you wouldn't straight away go for a bone marrow culture. No, that, that's, that's correct. It is invasive and uh, quite right about that. But there are uh, instances where you would consider it because you're more likely to actually get a positive result because you have a higher amount of bacteria. I hope that's clear. I think, Nisha, um, I mean, that sort of thing generally occurs in the background of, P of a PUO, where the patient has been having a prolonged fever for about two weeks or three weeks and so on. And um, in that situation, a bone marrow is extremely useful. On the one hand, of course, it deals a uh, hematological diagnosis in the case of some hematological problems. But even with regard to infections, you, you can culture it for typhoid, for brucella, for visceral uh, and for, for a, uh, and, and also tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, Although it's an invasive test, I think in the setting of uh, prolonged fever without a diagnosis, uh, it's clearly a, a very useful test to have. And also um, uh, typhoid is one thing that we must not forget to do the culture uh, when we do the bone marrow in those patients. Agreed, sir. And also, guys, keep in mind your immunocompromised patients who may actually have a higher uh, risk of having these uh, pathogens that sir talked about. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, you may be able to uh, isolate the non-salmonella typhi and, uh, you know, sir talked about mycobacterium tuberculosis and even the non-tuberculous mycobacterium. So there is definitely uh, in certain patients uh, a rationale for doing it. Any more questions? Uh, I haven't, uh, yeah, I've got one question here. Let me see what that is. Are there any complications in pregnancy? Um, well, nothing specific for, specific for pregnancy, but uh, of course, it's not something that you'd like to have in pregnancy, especially because of the complications involved. And I suppose you have to be careful about antibiotic therapy also in pregnancy because we can't use uh, 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 the fluoroquinolones even if the patient was sensitive. But you could use the uh, uh, carbapenems and uh, uh, macrolides, azithromycin, carbapenems, and also the vitlactams as well. Um, so nothing specific to pregnancy with regard to typhoid, except the antibiotic therapy. And I think uh, Dr. Dinesha mentioned